One of the songs we get to sing tonight is Behold Our God. You know, as we think about how great God is, uh, I was just going through the, the book of Psalms and, and, and reading some of the chapters and passages there. In Psalms chapter 19, I want to read for us this evening. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, you look around. Uh, how many guys got to see the eclipse? The heavens declare the glory of God. It was awesome. It was great to, to just witness that. And uh, I, was, I was, of course, with the teens, but my dad was with my boys, and they were able to, to, to talk about what all that meant, and, and just, just to look around at the creation that God has given us. And, and even, you know, all those years ago, David could look around and say, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heavens, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. You know, just all of creation points to God. I don't know how you can look around and all the, the amazing things of creation and, and think that that was by chance. That just happened, you know. The order and the and the, the just the majesty points to a great God. And as we sing these songs tonight, we think about our God. I want us just to to remember that every time you look outside and and you get to witness the beauty of creation, behold our God. Let's let's pray together. Lord, we do love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can come, sing praises to your name, and worship you this evening as a church family. God, I pray that as you are lifted up, that we would honor you. Um, that, you would, uh, that you would bless our meeting this evening. And we just need your presence. We need your help. We just, uh, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing.
you may be seated. Jesus told us 2,000 years ago that our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. He also promised us that only after we accomplish that task will we receive the blessing of His return. So, how are we doing accomplishing our mission? To answer that, let's classify the 7 billion people on the earth today into three groups. Let's start with the Christians. About 33% of the world's population would identify itself as Christian. We call this segment of the population World C, C for Christian. It's important to remember that not all of the people that fall into World C are true believers in Christ. They merely identify themselves as Christian because of nominal belief in Jesus or because they live in a country where everyone is considered Christian, so they would do the same. Next, there's the 38% of the world that has access to the gospel but has chosen not to follow Jesus. They have Bibles in their language, churches nearby, friends or co-workers who are potentially Christians, or access to other Christian resources in their language. These people have access to the good news, but just haven't acted on it yet. This segment of the population is called World B. That leaves us with 29% of the world, just over one out of every four people on this planet who not only have never heard of Jesus, they have no chance of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. They have no access to the gospel, no Bibles, no churches, no believers nearby, no chance to learn about Jesus. We call that 29% World A. Now on to missionaries. Only one out of every 1,800 Christians in World C decides to serve as a cross-cultural missionary. So, we can pull 400,000 missionaries out of that World C population. That's our total cross-cultural missionary force worldwide. Did you know that 72% of all our missionaries are going to World C? That's right! The vast majority of the missionaries being sent out are going to the people of the world that have Bibles and established churches. 25% of the missionaries are sent to World B, where there is already some access to the church and to the Bible. That leaves only 3% of the total missionary force to handle all of World A, the section of the population without any chance of hearing about Jesus. 29% of the world has no way to hear the gospel, but we're sending only a tiny portion of our Christian workers to them. What about finances? Annually, all those Christians in World C earn a total of $42 trillion. And together, they give about $700 billion to Christian causes each year. That includes everything. Christian nonprofits, churches, youth programs, missions, etc. Can you do the math? Less than 2% of Christian income is being given to Christ's causes. Out of that $700 billion given to all Christian causes, only $45 billion is given to missions specifically. That's a little over 6%. In fact, there is more money reported embezzled from the church each year than is given to missions. Remember those 400,000 missionaries? We have $45 billion to support them and their cross-cultural work. But how exactly is it allocated? Well. $39 billion goes to World C every year. Yep, 87% of that mission's money is being spent in areas of the world that have Bibles and churches available. $5.4 billion, or 12%, goes to World B each year, those that have access to the gospel message but have rejected it. That leaves only $450 million, or 1% of all mission's money, going to World A, the least reached people of the world. To put that into perspective, Annually, Americans spend more money on Halloween costumes for their pets than get sent to World A. To summarize, only 3% of our missionary force, armed with only 1% of missions giving, is going out to reach the 2 billion people who don't have access to the gospel. 2 billion people are still waiting for the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's a question for you. What are you going to do to change that?
found a Gideon Bible in that cheap hotel. She read the story about Jesus and the woman at the well. She found herself inside those pages and wondered how she could have got so far gone. So far away from home, and she cried out. my slate completely clean I'll do anything On the other side of Calvary God saw us lost He looked at you and at me and then he looked The price, the sacrifice it would take, who would pay, who would go. Then Jesus stepped down from his throne. He said, I'll do anything, I'll pay any price. Whatever it takes to make something of their lives and make a way to start all over and wipe their slate completely clean, I'll do anything. I'll take up that cross, lay down my life, and go to Calvary. I'll come back with the keys I'll do anything I'll pay any price Do whatever it takes To make something of their lives And make a way their slate completely clean I'll do anything oh I'll do anything Let's stand, let's sing again before the throne of God above.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're going to have a testimony tonight from Dr. Catro, so I'm going to ask her to come. And she's serving in medical missions, so you'll be in prayer for her and as she comes to share her testimony tonight. Good evening. It is wonderful to be back tonight. I uh, had a wonderful drive coming back from Toronto. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed last night talking with all of you, hearing the interest of, can you take this? Can you take this? A lot of it was yeses, and I love that, that you guys were willing to go look at your closets and see what you could pull out to bring me. So thank you so much. Um, as your pastor, and for those who, last night, I am Dr. Patricia Catro. I am a family practice doctor. I did eight years in the U.S. Air Force and got out in September, and Lord willing, what was my vacation plans will now be my life plans, serving the Lord in multiple countries around the world doing short-term trips and other medical opportunities. Pastor said to say a little bit of a testimony. Um, I was racking my brain because as you can imagine, there's so many stories that I could tell, but I think the one I'm going to tell you is of Beatrice. Um, Beatrice is actually not a patient. Beatrice was my translator. Uh, Beatrice started out as a Bible student in Uganda, only person in her family who was saved. Uh, started out when I met Beatrice, it was her, one of her first times translating, and she was very soft-spoken. And that doesn't work for a clinic when you speak very, very softly. So the first clinic was Beatrice, speak louder. So this was her whisper. And watching as she went from a Bible student who was in like with her future husband, and then the next time Beatrice spoke like this, I was like, you're improving, can you do better next time? And getting to know her heart, how she loved the Lord, and she chose to work extra hours at the school to pay for her tuition. She would translate for us all day, and then we would go um, up to the shower. There was only one shower on the property for the second trip because we were in three high bunk beds. And we would go up to Keith um, Stensis's office, and there was a shower in there. And she would wait until 2 in the morning. We were all done. She'd clean that as part of her tuition before she would go to bed to get up at 6 in the morning with the rest of us got up to come with us to start again. The next trip, in between that, Beatrice got engaged to a gentleman who also was in the Bible college, and Keith was thrilled because this was the first couple that married Christian to Christian couple in his ministry. A lot of them, as you can imagine, want to marry somebody, they go and they look for a non-Christian. So this, Beatrice was the first lady to marry a Christian man in their, in their church. In between that second trip and my third trip, Beatrice got engaged, thrilled for her. And the Lord led me to give a little bit of money because they have a bride price in many of these countries. What I didn't know and I'd communicated with Keith was about how much I was going to send. Not much to me, I was on a doctor's salary, but maybe it could make a help for their ministry. I got an email back from Keith eventually and it said thank you so much that was the exact amount we needed because what happened was Beatrice's family even though they hadn't done much with her in several years they wanted their bride price so they actually ended up kidnapping Beatrice and holding her for ransom and refusing to release her for her wedding and the amount I gave was the exact amount that they needed to get her out of I would say out of hawk but that's basically what it was right and they released her so she could get married the next trip I was on, she had a baby, had a little boy, and was, I was able to meet him and hold him. And I asked her if she knew somebody who could fix some of my, a piece of my clothes that had torn because I couldn't get it fixed in the U.S. And I said I was willing to pay. I just had to get it back before the end of the trip. Unbeknownst to me, she stayed up all night and did it herself. That's the heart of these people that we are going to help in Uganda. Her and her husband took the pastorate of the church for a period of time, had to step away for some personal reasons, and she reached out to me and poured her heart out in an email. And because there were some things going on, I reached out to the missionary, and I was able to help her, not financially, but just by having a person that she could reach out to, to say, God is going to get you through this difficult time. When I went back, I didn't hear from her for a long time, but when I went back on this fourth trip last year, I was able to hear her 
tell me thank you because I didn't know how that affected her. I didn't know if I had stepped out of place, but I reached out to the missionary so he knew we were, I was in contact with her at the time. He was able to use that communication to help her and her husband through that situation. And he was able, and that apparently helped her get down on her knees and start praying because I didn't know it, but she was at a point where she was about to decide to turn towards the Lord or away from him. This last trip, she now has two children. Her, her husband is back in the ministry. God has brought him back in a different capacity. And now she's still serving the Lord. Now this last trip, when I had a patient that the Lord said, speak more to, I had not a doubt that Beatrice knew how to witness. So when the Lord said, stop and look at this lady, I looked at her after an argument. I, sorry, I did argue with the Lord. I'm not that holy that I don't argue with the Lord because I was busy. I was on a roll. And when I said Beatrice, ask her if she's saved. Oh, she goes to church. She went to church. She was baptized. No, no, no. Ask her if she's saved. So she did. And she turned around and said, okay, she's not saved. Tell her about Jesus. I started with my normal translators. I have to go sentence by sentence. But with Beatrice, I looked at her and I said, Beatrice, you know what to say. These are your people. You've been witnessing to your Ugandan um, fellow people for years now. Go ahead. And by the end of that conversation, that young lady got saved. She is a mom to at least one baby that we know of. And she left thinking she knew the Lord, thinking she had a semblance because she was baptized. So she was a Christian. And she walked out of that clinic with Beatrice's help because Beatrice has a heart for her people. By the way, Beatrice speaks like this now. Took a couple trips, but she is right on. I didn't have to stop and think with Beatrice. I could just talk because we have that sisterhood. We have that common bond in Christ that you get nowhere else in the world. No matter what nation, nationality, there's that bond in Christ we have. So when I go, these are the people I'm supporting. I'm supporting Beatrice reaching her own people. I'm supporting Keith Stensis as he's reaching out to the people God has called them to. So when I think of a testimony, I could have told you instead about something else, but I want you to know these, this is why I go. I go for these people who are going to Liberia and are going to work every day, some days not knowing what the next day is going to bring. But if I can step in and in one week give them that sense of relief and that they're not alone and that we care about them, all of us, all of you who support us, are part of our ministry. And if I can help that couple there, then praise be to the Lord. So as we move forward, thank you so much once again for having me. Really enjoyed the pies. Wish I could have had more, but my calorie count wouldn't allow it. I still went over. All right, we'll have the ensemble come. They're going to sing for us tonight.
is not fame that I desire, nor stature in my brother's eye. I pray it said about my life that I live more to build your name than mine. share a video with you tonight just a short update about two minutes on Cody and Amy Crevar and brother Cody and Amy went down to North Carolina for the missions conference at brother Shirley's church uh, while he was here last November he got talking to them they were invited down brother Shirley got him into several other churches and then our friends missionaries the Woon family they're out of North Carolina and we I connected the two of them and brother Woon got him into another dozen churches or so and so for three months they've been in North Carolina three four churches a week just church to church and it's been a very profitable time for them. And so I asked Cody to send us a video and give us an update. You'll see the kids, and they've grown a little bit. And uh, so let's, let's go ahead and roll that now. Hello, Bethel Baptist Church. It's good to be part of your missions conference. Uh, pastor asked me to uh, give you a quick update on what we've been up to and what we've been doing. And uh, we have been in North Carolina for a good number of weeks. I think spent the majority in North Carolina. Um, had the opportunity to also just stay at a church, Northwood Baptist Church. They have an RV hookup, and we've had a great opportunity there to just to be able to to hook our trailer up and use that as a base. And uh, we've been to over 30 churches and um, keeping a full schedule. And right now we're in Virginia for the next couple of weeks, and then we'll head down to Asheville, and then we'll head back home. And uh, I could really say we miss you guys. And we also miss Tim Hortons. <laughs> and so um, we're looking forward to seeing you in May. And I believe we're at something pretty close to 38% now. And so the Lord's helping us along. We've been able to get involved in some of the ministries here. If you read my prayer letter, we're able, I was able to get into the elementary school and, and preach to the, to the children there. And two children got saved. And uh, I believe we traveled 11,000 kilometers so far. And so we've uh, been all over the place, and uh, Oliver's got a voice now, so, and two teeth. And uh, anything that you wanted to add? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your prayers. I know that, that you guys have been praying. We feel it, so thank you. And we miss you. We miss yeah. you a lot. There's definitely been times we've felt it. Anything you want to say? I guess. You guess? <laughs> Hey, guys. <laughs> all right. Well, we will talk to you later, and we will see you soon. Can we all say bye? Bye. 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 Oh, they all just act like their grandmother, don't they, Tina? Yeah. All right. Well, we're glad to have the Birchwell family with us as well, Liberia. And so he's going to come and preach to us tonight from the Word of God. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I'm glad to hear that they're, uh, is this a little too close? Do I need to do anything to that or you got it all under control? Okay, cool. Better you than me. I'm glad they're in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina is a good place to be. I'm a bit partial to it myself, but uh, I'm going to miss Tim Hortons too. Uh, I've discovered that and uh, nobody makes a honey crawler like uh, Tim Hortons. I've never had one like it and I will never have one like it again after I leave Canada. So... Oh, the economy there in Ajax is going to take a hit when I leave, though, because there is a Tim Hortons that is right there within walking distance of where we're staying at Faithway, and so I have been hitting that up on a regular basis. So, But man, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for making us feel welcome. Uh, thank you for the comfortable accommodations. Thank you for stopping by the table, talking to us about Liberia, taking a prayer card. Uh, once again, if you have not stopped by the table and got a prayer card, please pick one up. Uh, we did not get these made just so you could be blessed with our smiling faces. This is so you can remember who we are, 
to pray for us because we need all the prayer that we can get. And uh, my poor wife, uh, honey, go ahead and smile and wave, why don't you, just in case there's somebody here that this is my wife, Elizabeth. Uh, that young lady right there, she needs even more prayer than I do because uh, she's got to put up with me. So uh, please be in prayer for us. Thank you guys once again. I've really appreciated our time with you. It's been a blessing to meet you guys and uh, Dr. Patricia as well. We have some friends that are in the medical missions and uh, talk about a way to reach the 29%. Uh, that is it. You know, there's a reason why the 29% is there. We know who they are. Normally they don't like us. They don't want to talk to us, but they'll come take our medicine. And uh, that's a wonderful way to get into some of these places. Uh, so very excited about that. The one thing that I see and this is just my opinion in medical missions, that a lot of the people that do it, uh, they're doctors, they work full time, and they do these missions trips on the side. You know, it's not, they're not doing them all the time. You know, so very excited to see somebody that's willing to make that their full time uh, missionary venture. Uh, but thank you guys once again, and thank you for everyone that uh, worked in the uh, song service. That has just been such a blessing to me uh, today. And man, if you can't preach after that, you might as well just give it up. So go ahead and turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 28. We started there in Sunday school. Uh, this evening, we're going to kind of sit here a little bit, and we're going to look at this, and we're going to take it apart, nuts and bolts, and we're going to look at the Great Commission and you. The Great Commission and you, the Great Commission and me. Uh, the Great Commission is not just something for missionaries that go with mission boards and go on deputation and then go live overseas somewhere. That is a part of missions. Uh, but missions in general is something that we are all responsible for. Those of us have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a reason why he has left us here. You know, if you think about it with me for a second, uh, if this world is really as sinful and wretched as the Bible tells us that it is, and if heaven is really as great and wonderful as the Bible tells us, us that it is, and if Jesus Christ really died on the cross of Calvary so that we could be in God's presence like he says that he has, then why are you and I still here? Uh, we are here for a purpose, and that purpose is to let our lights shine where God has placed us, because there are those that have never heard. Those are, there are those that have heard and they're gonna need to hear a few more times before they accept Jesus Christ. And I don't know why God chose to use me. And if you were honest, you probably don't know why God has chosen to use you either. He tells us in, in the Bible that it's so the glory will go to him and, and not to us because people look at our lives and uh, we are frail, we are disobedient, we are unfaithful, uh, we fall far short of God's designs for us. And he's always still working on us. We have that hope and we have that desire. Uh, you know, but I don't know about you, I'd have chosen somebody that would obey. I'd have chosen somebody that would take my commands seriously. I'd have chosen somebody that would be a better image of Jesus Christ, but he's chosen us. And so that's why we're here today, that's why we're here tonight, and we're gonna look at something called the Great Commission and you. The Great Commission, it's not this pie in the sky, I idea. It's difficult for people like you and me to understand. It is a privilege. It's an opportunity. It's also our obligation, but it is a privilege for you and I to partner with God in achieving his purposes and his plan in reaching the whole world with the gospel. The main thought for this evening is this. God has delegated the Great Commission to you. He's delegated it to you. And he has provided you with everything that you need in order to obey him. I, uh, that's the encouraging part for me. So we're going to see four things this evening. Two things that have to do with our responsibility. And two things that have to do with the divine assistance that God has promised and has already provided in order to help us as we set out to obey his command. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together here this evening. Thank you for these folks that decided to put you first on a Sunday evening and come back out to hear your word pre preached and lift you up in song and praise. And Lord, I pray that you bless these folks uh, for making that decision. 
Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we open your word. I pray that you'd help me to relay clearly uh, what you have taught to me. Lord, I pray that this would be an encouragement and a challenge and an inspiration to all of us, myself first and foremost, Lord, as we seek to carry out your plan for us, be better stewards of the gospel, and carry out this thing called the Great Commission. Thank you for loving us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray these things, amen. Matthew chapter 28, we'll go back to verses 18 through 20, we'll start. The Bible says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world, amen. The first thing I'd like to show you guys from God's word here this evening in Matthew chapter 28 is number one, your action is assumed. Your action is assumed. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, We have the God of all the universe. We have the God that spoke this entire thing into existence. This all exists for his honor and for his glory. The Bible says for his honor and glory all these things were created and it's by his power that all these these things are held together. And so we have the God of all the universe, the God that created us, the God that gave you and I life, the God before whom you and I will someday stand and give account of our lives, and he is giving us a command to go. Now, I don't know about how it was for you growing up, uh, but in my home, uh, my mother, uh, I was going to say my mom and my father, but really my mother uh, was the supreme law of the land. And when she said, go clean your room, when she said, pick up your mega blocks, when she said, come inside, get cleaned up and go to the dinner table, she meant those things. And my action when she gave a command was always assumed. Now, I remember uh, I didn't always obey those things. And there was a, a price that I paid for that. I, I got quite a lot of spankings as a kid, but I deserved every one of them, and I'm thankful for them as well, and very thankful for my mother. Uh, But the point of the matter was this. I knew that when I was given an instruction, it was non-negotiable. I didn't have a choice. I was going to obey, or I was going to disobey and suffer the consequences, and then wind up obeying later. And, you know, folks, my mother, uh, for everything that she was and is to me, uh, she's a far cry from the sovereign of the universe. You know, many times when we hear this passage of Scripture preached or we read it in our devotions or on a devotional podcast or something along those lines, we praise God for all those people that are going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, and we mean well. And maybe we give money to support that, and maybe we have missions prayer cards on our refrigerators and we pray for them, and that's a wonderful thing. Praise the Lord for that. But this is talking to you just as much as it is talking to me, and it is a non-negotiable. This is a command. Our action is assumed. God expects us to obey this. In fact, when we look through early church history, we see that church of Jerusalem, you know, kind of for different various reasons, you know, people from all over the known world were coming to Jerusalem to hear about the gospel, to hear about the Jesus that had worked these miracles and had died and risen from the dead. And they came to Jerusalem and they got saved and they joined the church and they stayed and they didn't go out. And we know what happened. The Lord sent dire persecution upon them because their purpose was to be spread throughout the world. And if they weren't going to go voluntarily, then they were going to be forced. Uh, I'm not saying anything about our current state of things today, but uh, we still have a command here, folks. And God still assumes us to obey. It doesn't mean you sell all your belongings and, and sail across the sea somewhere. You know, only you know where God is or isn't leading you. That's something he does with you. Uh, Not with me, not with your pastor, and that's between you and God. And it would appear that God has led you here. Uh, So like I said this morning, whether it's across the sea, across the city, or across the street, God has a light that he has given to you, and he wants you to let that shine. So do that. Number one, your action is assumed. Uh, Number two, though, uh, moving along quickly here this evening, your message is mandated. Your message is mandated. God has given us a command. He expects us to go, so we need to go. But why are we going? Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So what are we teaching? What are we telling them? Where do we point the world for answers? What do they need to know? 
Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse uh, 22. And here, here, you know, the Holy Spirit, uh, by inspiration through Paul, has given us this wonderful passage of Scripture. And Paul says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And by the way, these are two very different groups of people, all right? The Jews were deeply religious, uh, even though they didn't necessarily know why. It's still that way today. They are deeply religious. They have their, uh, at the time, they had their sacrifices. They have their rituals. They have their traditions. And they are deeply religious and yet deeply unfulfilled. And they were constantly throughout the life and ministry of Jesus Christ begging for another sign. Show us another sign. Give us another sign. Anything to prove to us that there is truth and worth and validity in the path that we are walking down. So you have the deeply religious person, and then over here you have the Greeks. And in their time, that was kind of the age of enlightenment. Think about the Renaissance after the Dark Ages, the grip of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the perverted form of Christianity that's been holding the world in darkness. And now you have these free thinkers that are shoving religion aside, and they're still stepping out and exploring man's reason and man's wisdom and all the answers that man has to offer. And they believe that we're gods unto ourselves. And that's what the Greeks believed of their time. Sure, they had their mythology, but the philosophers that we think of, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, these men uh, that are now looked back and heralded as great minds of their time, they were moving their culture away from the myths of religion and into the reality of man's supremacy in all things. This where secular humanism was started. And so we have these two very separate groups that were the dominant factors in Paul's time. And by the way, they're still the dominant factors today. You have deeply religious people whether it's you know Anglican or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Catholic or any of these different, even Muslims, they are deeply religious, but there's no truth in their religion. They're seeking for a sign. And then you have the free thinkers of today that are reminding us that uh, the religion is the opiate of society and religion is responsible for the division and the divides and all the messes we have today. And we just need to explore ourselves and empower ourselves and elevate ourselves because man is all that man needs. These two groups, they're still here today. And Paul says they both need to hear one thing. He says, we preach Christ. We preach Christ. Verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. You know, folks, our message is not our own. And I find this to be very comforting. I find this to be very empowering because nothing that comes from this kid up here is going to be worth your time. It's going to be worth you listening to. It has no answers for you. It doesn't even have answers for me. We are specks in an infinity. Who are we to say that we have answers? But the message we preach, the message I'm preaching tonight is not mine. We are talking about what God has said, what God has given to us. And we don't have to study and ponder and meditate and philosophize about the world's problems. We don't have to build rapport. Uh, We don't have to cultivate names for ourselves or compound experiences and degrees to the ends of our names so that people will deem us worthy of listening to. We don't have to plumb the depths of man's recorded wisdom. In fact, Romans chapter one tells us exactly where that mess has gotten us. Look around today. Acts chapter one and verse eight. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto your college's accreditation, unto the scholasticism of your research, unto the clinical trials that prove your counseling methods, unto the keys of cultural appreciation or the charitable deeds that win friends and influence people. Those are all good things in their rightful place. But that's not what he said. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me. Folks, we 
preach Christ. As they sing on the platform just a few minutes ago, it is for the cause of Christ. We lift his banner high. The power is in our message, and our message is not our own. Our message is Christ. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just, those who have been justified, uh, they shall live by faith. Now this fact is extremely liberating. It should be. Because think of this, every time you obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit, every time you obey the commands of God and speak the name of Jesus into somebody's life, the responsibility of the power isn't on you, it's on him. We have been called to preach. We've been called to speak. We've been called to testify. It's God that does the work. We simply obey and we open doors, we speak the word, we speak the name of Jesus, we open the light to shine into their hearts a little bit, and it is God that does the rest. My friends, if you're worried about how to bring somebody to Christ, if you're worried about getting your words right, you can stop. Tell people what God has done for you. Tell them, John 3.16, memorize the Romans road. It's not everything that you need, but it's a great place to start. You may be clumsy. You may be socially backward. You may be shy. You may not like doing it. But when you step out and do it, the results that follow afterwards are on God and not you. Your only obligation is to be a faithful messenger, to be a truthful mouthpiece. Share the message of Christ and open the door for God to do his work. Yeah. Number one, our action is assumed. God has given a command. We, we'd best obey. Uh, number two, our message is mandated. We don't have to come up with our own answers. We preach Christ. The Bible says that this is a gospel of peace. What does the world need today if not peace? The great minds of our time can't come together and give us, give, and give us any peace. Our leaders can't give us peace. The UN hasn't given us peace. Our, our, our society isn't finding any peace, but we have the gospel of peace. We have the message with the answers. Our actions assumed, our message is mandated, but now we're gonna see the focus shift from our responsibility to God's part uh, in this partnership. Number three, we see that God's power is provided. God's power is provided. We talked about this a little bit with the fact that the power is in the message, but look at verse 18. Notice that Jesus didn't start with verse 19. You ever thought about that? He didn't just show up and say, go ye into all the world. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he didn't. He started with verse 18. And in verse 18, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore because of these things, because of the power that I am giving you, because of the power that is mine, I am commanding you to go. Notice in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus told his disciples to wait in the upper room until they were endued by power from on high. He said, wait here until the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Wait here until you receive God's power. God has not asked us to do anything that he has not equipped us to do. I'm so thankful for that. You know, if you were a father and you take your, your two-year-old son and you give him a four-pound splitting mall and you tell him to go and chop firewood and stack firewood, you would be of all men most cruel and unfair because you have equipped a child poorly for a task. In fact, you have not even, he can't do it on his own and yet you've burdened him with that. None of you would do that. Neither would God. You know what he does is he comes alongside and says, you, you want to help dad with this? Here, this is how we do it. And he bends down and he, he, he shows us. And you know, we're not the ones swinging the mall. We're not the ones splitting the wood. We're not the ones preparing for the winter. Dad's the one doing it, but he's letting us help. And it's his power in that tool, not ours. You know, think about the elephant and the mouse walked across the bridge and mouse gets the other side. It's like, man, we made that thing shake. He, 
Well, take that and apply that to this. God has told us to change the world, and we know it's been done before. We have a testimony of world leaders recorded for us in the book of Acts saying that these uneducated fishermen that had spent some time with Jesus had turned the entire world upside down. And they didn't even have the entire Bible. They didn't even have the full canon of the inspired scriptures. You and I have a leg up on them. And some of us, we've spent our lives with Jesus. Let's go turn the world upside down. It's not going to be us that do it, but we have God's power given to us. You know, think about the boundless power of God that's been manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. Think about the many miracles. I like the feeding of the 5,000. That's the first one that comes to mind, maybe because I'm a boy and, and I like to eat food. You know, but I think about the feeding of the 5,000 or Peter walking on the water to get to Jesus or you know what about what was the resurrection that's a miracle there now what what about the the widow's son that Jesus raised to life as he was being carried out of the city to to to, to be buried you know think about that uh, what about Jairus's daughter uh, that he raised from the dead uh, what about the many lepers that he healed You know, these are wonderful things, and we can get very excited about the power of Jesus Christ in the gospel, and we think about how amazing it must have been to be there and to see that. I mean, wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead? Wouldn't you have loved to see these things? And then we remind ourselves that, hey, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, amen? And the same God that stopped the mouths of the lions for Daniel, the same God that opened the Red Sea for the Israelites, the same God that fed the 5,000 is the same God uh, that told us that if we have a mustard seed grain of faith, that we can move mountains in his name. He's the same God that sent us, and praise God, the same God they had is the same God that we have today and we can praise the Lord for that amen Amen. so then how come when it comes time to tell somebody about Jesus all of a sudden like oh I can't do that you see the inconsistency there The power God has given us, the power of the Holy Spirit that was given to us in Acts chapter one and verse eight, it is very clearly laid out that the power God has given to us is so we can witness to others. We have that power so we can show others Christ. God's power has already been provided. My friends, our action is assumed. Our message is mandated. Praise the Lord. God's power is provided. And then number four here this evening as we come to a close, God's presence is promised. God's presence is promised. Look at verse 20. He says, and lo, he says, get this, listen to this. Behold, I am with you always, even under the end of the world. I don't know about you. I'm a very young fella, but there's already been some times in my life where I was very, very glad to know that I was not actually alone, no matter how much I may have felt like it. So it's quite a comforting verse, and I'm sure there's been times in your lives where you realize that It's a wonderful promise to fall back on that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And we have that promise here that God will always be with us. And you know, praise the Lord when God commanded us to go. He didn't command us to go alone. Turn back in your Bibles, if you will, to Exodus chapter four. Exodus chapter four. And this is a a wonderful passage of scripture because it's just such an encouragement Uh, to me, and I'm sure it'll be an encouragement to you. Exodus chapter four, and here we find God calling his man. And by the way, in this passage of scripture, we're gonna see God calling his man, commanding him to do something. Uh, God is going to give him his message. God is going to give him his power, and God is also going to promise him his presence. And I challenge you, make a devotion of this. Make it a personal study. Go into your Bible and find a place where God has called a man and told or a woman and told them to do something and not given them a message, given them his power, and promised his presence. If you find it, write me an email 
and I won't preach this sermon again, but uh, find, look for one. You, you, you won't find it because every time God gives his feeble creation a command, he knows that they need his power and he knows that they need his message and he will promise his presence. That's what we see here in Exodus chapter four. And God has just commanded Moses, his chosen servant, uh, to go forth with a message that God has mandated to, to him. He's gonna go and stand before Pharaoh and say, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Uh, that's a pretty daunting message to deliver. So when you stop and think about it, you can't really get on Moses too much for getting cold feet here. Uh, so God gives him his power. He tells him, hey, throw your rod on the ground. Moses throws the rod on the ground. It turns into a snake. Uh, he says, okay, now bend down and pick it up. And uh, Moses probably cautiously bends down and, and picks it up and it turns back into a rod and, and that wasn't enough. So God told uh, Moses, hey, put your hand uh, in your bosom. He puts his hand in his bosom. He says, pull it out. He pulls it out and it's stricken with leprosy. And Moses is like, God, why'd you do that? And God says, put it back in. So he puts it back in and says, pull it back out. And he pulls it back out and it's healed. And so God has given him this calling. He's given a message. He's given his promise of his power. And then here in Exodus chapter four and verse 10, we find this. Moses said unto the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since I was spoken unto thy servant. But I am of slow speech and of a slow tongue. He says, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't speak well. I, I don't speak well in front of people. I don't speak well at all. Verse 11, the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now whatever it is about you that you think keeps you from being able to be a witness. God already knows. He created you for a purpose. He created you the way that you are. Yes, we are all flawed by sin, but we are created in his, in his image. The Bible tells us in Psalms that our individual members, while we are yet in the womb, God is in control and aware of these things. You were born with a purpose. You've been equipped for that purpose. And God will help you fulfill that purpose. And we find him assuring Moses of that in this passage. And the same thing that he says here about saying, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. He also said that to his disciples when he sent them out to witness. Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, he says this, and when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, he says not everybody's gonna like your message. They're gonna get offended. They're gonna get upset. Uh, they're gonna pull you into the judgment seat. He says, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. Don't worry about that. Why? Because in verse 12, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. You know, my friends, when God's word is clear, and it is, over and over and over again, uh, when you assume your responsibility to take action for God, when you deliver the message that he has mandated to you, God will provide his power and his presence will be with you. You know, you write this down because you can take it to the bank, ingrain it in your mind. When I go for God, I do not go alone. When I go for God, I do not go alone. It can be daunting. It can be scary. I love Miss Pat Miss, Miss Patricia's transparency in her testimony. Uh, we all argue with God sometimes about, oh, are you sure I'm supposed to talk to, to that person? I mean, he looks kind of big. It looks kind of scary. It looks kind of mean. Or there's no way that she wants to hear what I have to say. And we have those conversations with the Lord. We all do, don't we? But when we step out in obedience, it's God's power that does the work. And he steps out with us. My friends, in conclusion here today, we've seen from God's word how the Great Commission relates to you. This is a partnership between you and God. He's given you a command and your action is assumed. 
He's giving you a message to preach, and that should be a relief because you don't have to make one up yourself. Just preach Christ. That's the answer to all the world's problems in a nutshell. Preach Christ, and you don't have to do it alone because it is God's power that will get you through. It is God's power that will do the work in hearts. It is God's power that will reap the harvest of souls, and when you step out and do this, whether it's in your hometown or in a foreign land far away, whether you're with a crowd of people or whether you are all alone, surrounded by people that hate your guts God is with you take action proclaim Christ nothing will be impossible because God's power is provided and you don't need to be afraid you'll never be alone because God's presence is promised this is the great commission in you let's pray dear Lord thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this evening Lord, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word with our lives. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for being patient with us. And Lord, I pray that you be with us all, dear God, both corporately and individually. Lord, that we would take our responsibility to go for you a little bit more seriously. Lord, help us to obey. Lord, if there's somebody here this evening that you have your calling on their life. Lord, I, I pray that you would work in their heart and lead them to that point where they would be willing to give their life to you, to spend their life serving you, however that might be. Lord, thank you for your power. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the message of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet tonight with our heads bowed. And if God has spoke to your heart, this altar's open. Maybe you were challenged to do more for the Great Commission and the cause of Christ tonight and be more faithful in sharing the gospel and be reminded tonight that you never go alone. The altar's open even now. If God has spoke to your heart, why don't you step out and come? Maybe there's somebody been here today and they just wonder what's all the fuss about. Why are you so adamant about preaching the gospel and taking it around the world? Well, that's because people are lost on their way to a Christless eternity. The Bible says all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And tonight, if you know for a fact that you're a sinner, we're all sinners, the Bible says so. And understand that you're lost without Christ. Maybe you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Because the gift of God is eternal life, but it's through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but through him. Do you know him personally tonight? Have you been forgiven of your sins? That's why we preach the gospel. That's why there's a great commission. That people just like you and I can come to trust Jesus Christ and be saved. If there's one that says, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved, would you pray for me? I want to pray for you tonight. I'm not going to call out your name. I won't embarrass you. But could I pray for you tonight? You're not sure you're saved. Is there one? You can look up here for a minute. Brother Roberts is going to give us some announcements. And uh, we just heard um, Brother Paul just let me know during the service that Bailey Dickinson went home to be with the Lord yesterday. And so be in prayer for his family. I know they'd appreciate that so much. Just a few announcements here uh, before we go tonight. Teenagers remember a trip in May the 2nd, bus trip to a tulip farm in Ridgeville, Ontario. And uh, you're leaving the church at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our Kingdom Builders, um, April the 26th, games night at Tony and Lori's home, 6.30 in the evening. Please bring a snack to share. And also our young adults, same night, April 26th, games night in the Olive Room at 7 p.m. And please bring a game or a snack with you as well. 
Uh, also, uh, remember our spring breakfast next Sunday morning at the, at the gym, 9.30 for our children, Sunday school children and their parents or guardians. Everyone's invited to come and be a part of that and uh, look forward to that next Sunday morning, 9.30 at the gym. Ladies volleyball night, May the 3rd. Uh, that's 6.30 in the evening. Please bring non-marking shoes. And also on the May long weekend, May 19th, Sunday night, uh, we have a connection group evening. And uh, we'll let you know more about that as time comes. Thank you for coming tonight. May God bless you as you go. God bless you.